So it's a pleasure to introduce Nick Jelpi, Nicholas Jelpi, our colleague and friend, um, assistant professor at FIU, right? Uh, associate. Is, associate. Associate professor, associate, right. Uh, who just had a um, um, book published um, during the COVID quarantine, but uh, I guess you will show us a little bit of that at the end. Um, so sure. Nick Jelpi is a licensed architect and he is the founder of Jelpi Projects, which is a firm that most of you have seen also the headquarters of uh, Jelpi Projects at MBUS, um, where he works and, and, and researches um, and does the fabrication, like the extensive uh, drawing and, and model making that is part of his practice. Um, Nick has won um, numerous design awards. He won a um, first prize of first place in the uh, international design competition for the Windwood Greenhouse Park. That was also a collaboration with um, Roberto Rovira, right, from FIU. Yeah. And um, it, that was in 2014. In 2016, he did a collaboration with Marcus Linenbrink. Um, that was a pavilion that was architecture by Nick Jelpi and the sort of painting um, works by Linenbrink that was nominated for the MCHAT um, awards at IIT uh, in 2016. He has received um, AIA awards, design, Miami Design Awards for Build Projects, and he has received the Curb uh, John Guns Award, naming him one of the top 10 John architects in America. JLP was trained in, in the New York office of Stephen Hall Architects, where you worked for like, what, 10 years? shot like 10 years, really six years. All right. Uh, he has taught at MIT, Ohio State University, and right now is uh, at FIU with us. Um, so he's going to talk about the Miami Beach house, the exotic concrete house that is where this Zoom lecture is happening, actually. All right. So if everyone can please mute them, um, yourself so we can stay here. Great. Um, nice, nice to see you all. Uh, I'll share my screen. Is this good? Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, I'm just going to start with this layout and, and this couple of images um, and just say, you know, this is a photograph of the house that some of you may have seen. And, and to summarize, this is a photograph of some material studies um, up on the top that, that we built at FIU. A lot of the research, applied research for the house came out of a grant at FIU um, that was you know, sponsored by a private individual. And it was um, basically to look at the potentials of a wood-based form of concrete. Um, and so this, this came out of some of those explorations. And this is a detailed photo of, of the cladding on this house. Um, and so I basically broke the slides. I, I'll, I'll caution you and apologize in advance. Uh, I basically went through the archive and tried to dig up everything that I thought might be relevant. Um, I even exported some of the construction documents and, and permit drawings, if, if you're curious about that, and also some construction photos. But basically the story of this house begins with the story this tree, this is not, this is um, called the uh, the Melaleuca tree. I forget the exact, the complete Latin name, but the Melaleuca tree, uh, and it looks like this. It has this really papery bark. It's native to Florida. Uh, sorry, it's native to Australia, um, and it was used as an ornamental tree species uh, in in South Florida, and it was scattered by aircraft throughout the Everglades uh, in the 50s, 40s, and 50s help to establish, you can see on the right side, these different densities of Melaleuca growing in the Everglades. Um, and so here on the top left, you see low density, but it, it grows very tightly together. So they scattered it along canals to basically firm up some of the shores and to assist with, with, with managing the, the drainage of the Everglades. Um, and then it quickly got out of control. Some of the problems with it are that 
it grows so densely in the Everglades that the birds can't fly between it. Um, the very large winged birds. And the Everglades is known as the river of grass. There really aren't a lot of um, really dense stands of trees outside the kind of tree islands and some of the palms and native pine trees. But this thing has really just kind of, they talk about it like it really has choked the Everglades. Um, it burns, tea tree oil comes from this tree. It burns very hot as a result of the tea tree oil. And then it itself is resistant to, to fire. So it'll kill everything around it and it will just sort of come back. Um, but here's a photo of, of uh, a compression cylinder. So through this grant at FIU, working with students as well, uh, we look for, you know, what, what could like some positive uses be for this plant that nobody really wants and that we view as negative. Um, and so this is a compression cylinder. And, and you can see the interesting texture of it that we really liked. We learned a lot about concrete, but basically, you know, I received, I think like 4,000 pounds of, of uh, wood chips of this tree, mineralized wood chips. So we got them in these big pallet bags and it was when I first arrived at FIU and I advertised an independent study, some students you know, signed up and we ruined all of our clothes and we mixed, we really experimented with, you know, I think of concrete as a kind of set strength of material, also a kind of fixed formula of ingredients, most of it pre-mixed that comes out of a bag. So we kind of reverse engineered standard traditional concrete and we looked at what we could do if we replace the aggregate with wood chips from this tree. And it's not raw wood chips. We actually received, um, you know, a sponsorship from a company. Their proprietary information was how to mineralize these wood chips, but it's very simple to do. Um, and in mineralizing the wood chips, they basically, you know, trees sequester carbon. They take out carbon from the environment. And it only gets released back into the environment if it burns. So what's, what's interesting about this is um, they're using wood, which has absorbed all this carbon from the environment, and by mineralizing it, they're kind of locking it in. At the same time, concrete um, has, a, has a really high carbon footprint because you have to bake the ingredients to such a high degree to give them some indigenous properties. So in a way, what we were trying to do was sort of offset the footprint of concrete. And part of that is because the sponsor is like a third generation precast concrete precaster in Belgium. So European Union building codes, they require more passive performance standards. So you, you, you basically need to build with insulating materials and concrete is not, it conducts very well. It's very heavy. Um, and I'll talk about more of that, but you see here different textures that result from different formulas that we were really empirically experimenting with. Here, this was a video, let me see if it works. Oh yeah, this is cool, watch this. I think the video doesn't work. Basically, I um, bribed a guy in the engineering school to let me use this compression machine. I brought him coffee and Red Bull and he let us use this. So we set up these compression cylinders and we would crush them and you can measure the, compress the compression strength. And this is what they do on job sites when they take cores and send them to labs to make sure that the concrete is really set up correctly. Um, concrete is also a bit of a mystery. There's so much chemistry involved in it that it might look correct, but fundamentally uh, it, it might not perform correctly. So, you know, this is standard procedure and we basically mixed all these concrete cores using wood chips and then tested them for compression strength. I think we had like 92 unique formulas where we were reducing water, adding admixtures, and something to say about the nature of, of concrete, maybe you know, maybe you don't, is that it has an inverse proportion of strength to water. You need the water to make it workable um, so that you can easily pour it and whatnot, but the more water you add to it, the weaker it becomes. So we liked this kind of dry mix that you see here in the texture. These are like some big chunks of material that we cast. Uh, and this is one of our students showing you could just cut it with a wood saw after. And so you see inside uh, the exposed fibers of these wood chips. And we, li we liked it. I mean, we liked, we liked the appearance of it. Um, we thought, thought about it like a kind of wooden terrazzo. 
these are some experiments we did where we basically started to combine the forms convex and concave and different uh, variants of that with different formulas of material uh, and different amounts of water and sand. Um, and so, you know, we liked the way this looked in theory. And then we started thinking about, I had the opportunity to renovate uh, the house I'm sitting in right now. Um, so this is an old 1962 house. This is it currently. Uh, I'll show you what it was, but basically it sits on a street corner. There's a golf course to the back of it, but it's a pretty typical Miami Beach lot that is, uh, um, you know, about 7,000 square feet. So I'll come back to the site plan, but basically uh, the house was this detached garage and it was a kind of J shape. You see it here. Uh, the detached garage covered by roof. So it really was like a U, but kind of a J and we added on to it. We proposed to add on to it. It was a two bedroom house. We really turned it into four. We added on and then we decided that we would use this material that we were experimenting with to clad the new addition and kind of blend it in, uh, blend between new and old. So this is a drawing of just what the new construction was. The rest of the house, which you know was a lot of work, was existing. And we did a fair amount of modification and, and uh, you know bringing things up to code and up to standards. But this is everything we were adding. So we were adding this kind of modest 400 square foot addition but then recladding the entire exterior. So you see this conceptual model here on the right. Uh, yes, you can see in this dashed line. So here was the house. So beyond this, we added this new construction and what was previously two bedrooms, we basically turned it into four and just totally opened up the rest of the house. What's nice about it is that, you know, this never really, read as a courtyard before this outside area and I should probably diagram this better but there was a large tree here it really read more like a traditional front yard um, and it wasn't particularly used the fronts of homes are I find are not used so much um, the backyard tends to get you know the most activity but by expanding this in this way and really lengthening this bottom bar of, of bedrooms we created this deep courtyard and this is like a view from the front door looking out towards the street and this really activated the front so this is standing at the street looking towards the house so you see this at all can you see my mouse henry anyone can you see where i'm pointing here yes yeah, yeah, yeah. that little roof jog is where the house originally ended and so we took out you know some landscape and some trees here and we extended the house to the front so you see this had an old hip roof this had a hip roof, we extended it to a gable roof. And you see the difference between new and old. This is in the evening when the lights are on and it's kind of dramatic, the shadows on the surface. But I'll show you photos at other times today where it's much more subtle. This is a side elevation. Again, you can see the roof jog where the house used to end. So it really ended like in line with this type line here. And this is um, a bedroom. That's a window with a built-in desk. And then we added more on. This is early in the morning. So the house, again, it, it existed, but it already phased due east. Uh, it was aligned on an east-west axis because of our street really ran properly north-south in front of our house. So um, in the morning, what you can see is as the sun comes up in the east on this side, it hits these tiles and casts these horizontal from east to west and what's really interesting is you know we can kind of project you could project like this tile onto a flat one but when you compound like projecting the profile of this tile onto another tile you get these like we didn't really expect the shadows to be the shape until we finally saw it um and, and we and we like them we, we like them and we, and we really love them uh, but the house kind of changes throughout the course of the day the shadows really exist early in the morning um, and then in the evening when the lights come on. Uh, but you get these cool moments and it's also a kind of idea about rustication um, and texture. And one idea is, you know, we're, we are using like, we are using the kind of traditional building materials of what you find in the beach, um, but we're adding a kind of unexpected substrate to it. And, and we wanted this idea that something's bubbling up from inside. We wanted someone 
kind of question, why is it like that? Or what is it? Uh, and, and kind of ask questions. And people really do come and kind of rub the tiles and, and pet them and, and treat them like something exotic. But these are some of the early studies we did where we were, you know, 3D printing scale models of the tiles, looking at the pattern. In, in the case of the house, there's four tiles and they're flat, they're flush. And then there's three that bulge out and they only bulge out either one inch, two inches or three inches, which is really this to scale. So proportionally it's this. Uh, at one point we were thinking you got two, four and six inches, which added a lot more material. We thought it was, we didn't like it because it was less, it, it, it was less subtle. We like the subtlety of this and I'll show you some photos where you, you know, don't quite notice it. This is really sort of the effect you get, like soft, a few shadows when the sun is coming down from the top. Um, and here, here, of course, I'm showing you more dramatic photos, but these are the elevations of the house. So this is the long elevation facing south. This is the line where the existing house ends, and this is what we added. And again, we kind of blended it together diagonally, like a kind of diagonal wave pattern. This is a section through that courtyard so the street is over here, you walk in, you kind of increase in elevation up to the finished floor elevation of the house. And we did some work where we raised the ceiling and converted this to rafters in the center section. So this really opens up, but you really have glass on both sides. So from the middle, you look out through the courtyard all the way, you can see the hotels on the beach. It's really a cool frame view. And then at the back, it opens up um, to the golf course and, and a, a small lap pool. Here you can see that, uh, the, the west elevation of this thing. And then these are what the thing is clad with if we zoom in a little bit. These are 24 inch by 24 inch, kind of a standard tile size, uh, but like big. And we, for a while we thought about doing smaller tiles, uh, but these are three inches thick. I'll show you some details of that. Uh, they're at, at the least three inches thick, and then they bulge out beyond that. And something I forgot to mention about the material, because it has a wood base, it's much more insulating and has a higher R value than typical concrete, which the aggregate is as conductive as, as the matrix. So um, it, it has more of an insulating effect. Uh, and that's why we thought it was a smart solution to put on the south facade of the building. So here we, you know, we did everything. We really experimented with, you know, making our own, own molds here. We laser cut a lot of sheets of really model making plywood. Um, and then from that we poured uh, urethane, like professional commercial grade urethane rubber into it. And then we made our own mold. So we were cast these, and we really liked this kind of patchy texture that would occur. And we, we thought it would be great if like, moss grew in this thing. You can see some of the drawings in the background. Um, in the end, this is not exactly what we did because it took a long time to make these by hand. They were heavy. I mean, they still weigh about 90 pounds each, uh, even though the material itself is 70% lighter than concrete. Our precaster said if these were solid concrete, they'd weigh three to 400 pounds. Um, so it's about 30% lighter, sorry, 70% lighter than traditional concrete. So, but in the end, we didn't want here, these are bags of the wood chips, the mineralized wood chips from our sponsor. Um, and they were eager to see this applied to a building. And we finally, after much uh, diplomacy, found a precaster in Hollywood, Florida. We couldn't find anyone in Miami who was willing to like work with an unknown material. Uh, and I said, you know, we're not asking you to like warranty it or guarantee it. We just we want you to make molds. Actually, we delivered the molds and we just want you to cast the molds for us. So we brought the wood chips. We actually CNC milled in the end master positive tiles for them. And then they made rubber molds from them and cast these. And then these are actually, they weren't using as sophisticated equipment as we had in the lab at FIU. So through the grant, I bought like a very high quality a batching plant, which mixes the concrete and you could add really fine, really small amounts of uh, ingredients and it would get thoroughly integrated. The problem is like in a bucket, if you're adding just, you know, half a gram or a gram of material, um, it's gonna hit the, hit the wet mix and just kind of get stuck together in place without really distributing. So these guys were just mixing concrete in buckets with drills. So we had to go with um, a much wetter mix. So you don't really see the porosity that 
was seen in some of the earlier studies. studies. But here, here, here they were looking at, um, you know, different, we really fine tuned the formula for the house with them. We had to kind of do it again. Uh, and you can see the different weights. This weighs 11.2 pounds, this 16 pounds, 18 pounds, 12, um, depending on how much water we added. And so here you can see they set up the molds and this was what we delivered to them. You can see in the end, we just glued a lot of plywood and we CNC milled the four unique, um, we called them the masters. We brought them to them and, and then they poured rubber on that and then poured the concrete into the urethane molds. And so there was a cost. You can see this is the top. So they were pouring them in. You can see the wood chips there. Uh, and they're much, they're much more solid looking than what we had originally intended. Uh, here is some photos from the job site. We, we thought, you know, the, the installer could just kind of look graphically at the thing. Um, but what we had to do is just kind of on site one day, we just hand lettered everyone, like all the flat ones we called A. It's the ones that bulged one inch, we called Bs, two inch Cs and three inch Ds. And we did it that way. And you can see this, this is uh, our engineered connection. These are basically, and we use these initially, um, these are actually galvanized. They should have been stainless steel. So we did a few with galvanized and then we, then we did the rest with stainless steel. But these are just metal angles that clip to the wall and the tiles sit on top of them. And then these are typical corrugated brick ties. So when you assemble a brick wall, you have the gap between the wall and the, and the backing uh, for drainage. And usually you just, you know, insert these between the coursing and then screw them into the wall to keep the thing from tipping. So these were really supporting the weight of the tiles. And then we had these to restrain them uh, on the top. And, and here they are all delivered on the site. And this was like the first, they first started installing them around one of the small windows, like you see here. Uh, you know, we were like really excited to, to see this finally happen. Uh, and so you can see they started around the window and then basically worked out in two directions from there. And the, the wall is waterproof with liquid waterproofing behind. Um, and then you can, you can see how, I don't know if you can see actually the clips. Uh, but you can see the bit, clips basically are here. And then, you know, they used a fair amount of, of, of like, you know, mortar uh, quick set. Here you can see one of the brick ties. And then if we slice into the house, so here's that elevation. If we cut through it, this is a section through here, through the new addition. And so you can see we, we added on. And again, we're, we kept the existing concrete block structure of the house. And then we just used this as a cladding. So we also didn't need the material to act like structurally. It, it's really a cladding. Um, but what you can see in this section is that because we had this you know, modularity of the tiles, we, we just did a few moves, like we played around with, you know, we could play with the location of the windows within the wall. So on the outside, they lined up. You could see that here. So from the outside of the house, you see this window, which is basically this height. And then you see this high one, which is up here, which is this dashed one. Um, and so we played around, you know, with the location of the window. So on the outside, they aligned with the grid and on the inside, they seemed you know, unrelated and misaligned. Uh, and we thought that was cool that the, the tiles could like stitch it together on the outside. And then here you see how we tried to program the windows. So some are traditional. Again, the windows are a little low, like the tie beam for the existing house was kind of low. So we couldn't like cut too high into, you know, what already existed. So we lined up the rest with it. So this is a four foot tall window because each of these tiles is two feet. And then you can see uh, the cladding, you know, connected to this wall on the outside and how you get a kind of thicker wall section, a thicker jam to the window. And then we programmed these. We basically, in each room, did a built-in piece of furniture at some of the windows. So, you know, here you can see a low window with a, with a low reading chair like that. Here you see the high one up in the air that you could like look out from the bed. And here's a corner desk. And then these are some of the models of those of those built-in conditions. So, um, you know, again, we started playing around with this. We wanted to draw the kind of idea and organization of the building inside as well. Um, uh, so, you know, cladding it with this kind of soft approach, 
we thought since we have this thicker wall section, we could cut through it obliquely uh, and play with some sun angles and then also kind of, you know, stitch the interior and exterior together using some millwork. So every room has like a, a built-in window desk. You see the bedroom. So there's one like this, one like this, one like this. And then here are those three bedrooms. This is really uh, an extra room that has become kind of a full-time guest room. But we had less children when we designed this house. Uh, but here you can see photographs of those things. And, you know, we, we obsessed over those things, you know. So uh, this one has a kind of soft corner to go with the corner window. Uh, there's a photograph of it and it faces the street. This is in, in, in the room that was the new addition. Uh, this is another one. Uh, basically, the old house ended here, and then it started new here. So we we did. This is a new window. We cut in. We we relocated the window that was there. We modified the sides of it, and then this one we cut in obliquely and made a kind of fluid built-in desk in this little nook here next to the closet. You can see it there. And then this one um, is actually in the larger bedroom, but it's just a small. Ledge. I'm actually sitting at it right now, giving this lecture, uh, looking out that window. But the idea was just to bring it in at an angle and then connect it and wrap around the corner. Um, and we use it a lot. We had ideas that it would be like a vanity, uh, but really it has become just a small like windowsill desk that, that we end up using a lot. Here's a photograph of it. And then last in the kitchen, and I'll, I'll show you this in the overall plan. Um, this was an existing jalousy window uh, with these horizontal louvers that you could open and close. We replaced them and we replaced all the windows with impact windows um, and really looked at, you know, tightening up the envelope of the building. But uh, at the window so height, we put in the hovering uh, built-in bench and we designed a custom table that sits in. Interestingly, if you look at the plan of the house, our family, we're six people. We spend most of our time like eating, coloring, uh, you know, using table space in this smallest portion of the house. Uh, the rest is really an open plan. And you can see this corner looks into the courtyard. Again, there's that roof jog in the background. This is all the new addition. And then if you look back from that breakfast room to the house, I just want to show a couple of interior photos. They're not that important, but this view here, we cut these two windows all the way through the plan. So from here, you could see through the south wing of the house, the, that bar. Uh, we've since had to construct a wall, so this view doesn't exist anymore. Um, but this opens up to the back. And here's the kitchen. So that breakfast room is over here. We introduced some skylights onto the north side of the house. This was kind of the dimmest portion of the house. So we get good natural light in there. And this was all chopped up. The plan, there were plan, there were walls here, there was a wall here. And we basically realized there were no structural walls in the house. It was all just kind of infill and programming. So structurally, there's a, a girder beam here, and the roof trusses run this way. And then from the front door to the back door, the roof trusses run that way, and it's symmetrical. And it's really simple, uh, a great layout, efficient layout for a house. I, you know, again, this house existed, the form of it, um, and we tried to just really take advantage of it and use it as best we could. Um, and I probably wouldn't have designed a house from scratch in this way, but now that I am kind of designing houses from scratch, like I'm often relying on this, and, and I, I would design a house like this. <laughs> this is looking from the kitchen basically towards the bar of bedrooms, and I just showed the show there's glass on this side and glass on this side. So or my daughter's sitting, you look out and you have this view out into the courtyard. So you can see from here, you look through the courtyard and that building there is like on the beach. We're only, you know, we're so close to the ocean. It's kind of a long drive to go up and cut across the bridges, but we're very close to the water. Um, and, and so you can see that view there. And then this is the view out the back. Here's the dining room. So all the, all the rooms, they're not, you know, they're just kind of planned manipulations. They aren't enclosed by walls. Uh, there is an office. We just tucked it under the pantry. And then coming back outside, because of this deep courtyard, you know, my, my father-in-law thinks I'm crazy because you can stand out here and kind of look through the house. So you can see all the way through the house from the street, but really only in this area. So from over here, you know, it kind of conceals the view and from over here, 
So at an oblique angle, you can't quite see into it. It's only when you're standing directly in the front. Um, and we've kind of like landscaped that area now. But again, here's the deep courtyard and this little breezeway here between the house and the garage. You know, it looks like that when it's empty. It's full of bikes now, but it has a nice kind of existing overgrown uh, 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 fence. And then from here, looking from this breezeway into the courtyard, it's great. You get this little sliver of light here and you get a really, we use this space a lot. I think much more than we would use a traditional backyard. Somehow it, it's like an additional room, like you're, you're in the house, but you're outside, you're kind of surrounded by walls. Uh, and, and really it's the highlight of the house is the courtyard. And then some more photos from the outside. You see as you come out the courtyard, the house wraps around and goes to the back. There's that roof jog. Here's the low window and the high window and the, the middle uh, furniture height window. We also put a, a window in, our, in the garage. Um, and then here's a few photos. And I just took some screenshots of our permit set. It was a really light permit set. And again, you'll see here, this was the, this was the existing conditions of the house. Uh, and so we basically, even this wall, we took out, we put it back, but we, we realized the, we opened it up and the electrical was like extension cords plugged in the receptacle behind the sheetrock. So we just took it all out. We replaced the, all the electrical and plumbing and mechanical systems. So at one point we took all the, all the walls out and just put them back where we wanted. We demoed this wall, this exterior wall and extended the envelope of the house. This was the site plan that we submitted with our site diagrams. I don't know if anyone would wanna talk about these things, but um, there it is. You can see the street corner it's on. And then this was our ground floor plan. And we just showed everything was on a 20, four inch module. In the end, the, uh, the exterior courtyard is paved in 24 inch pavers. The wall is clad in 24 inch tiles. The interior, the floor is 24 inch terrazzo tiles. And, and it, it doesn't seem as, as uh, hysterically rational as it sounds. Uh, but this was the roof plan or RCP. At one point I showed this because we actually didn't do this, but when we first submitted um, the existing mechanic equipment was here on this elevation like right there and it was behind plants but we removed all the landscape and obviously we didn't want the air conditioning to sit here so we initially proposed to mount it on the roof and then there were screening requirements so we thought of it as like a cool chimney a cold chimney um, to put it up on the roof and our engineer really uh, persuaded me not to do it in the end um, but because we didn't have you know currently consist cons uh, conforming setbacks. It was hard to fit it, except on this side, but we really didn't want it on this side. We wanted this side completely free of equipment and hose bibs and things like that. So we ended up putting on the north side and getting permission from the city to do that. Here's some of the wall sections. So you see, you know, the, the cladding here with clips supported by clips. And initially we were just proposing to use standard precast clips. Um, you can see the finished floor elevation was about 24 inches outside grade, um, which was kind of nice. It, it creates an interesting condition where, you know, you can basically, we have top down, bottom up blinds, so we can raise the blinds to here. So I should add notice, if you're standing outside, you can't see in, but if you're standing inside, you can see out, which is kind of nice. Um, here is our, you know, detail at grade and, you know, some of our flashing and, and uh, uh, drip edge details and some corner details again, because I'll say that working for Stephen Hall, like we, we had a kind of ingrained in our minds, like, first of all, you know, I think Stephen is a big fan of Carlos Scarpa where things are constantly slipped past one another um, for the expression of the joint. But also when it comes to construction, anytime you line something up, it becomes a big challenge in the field. So here we, essentially left the dimension of this a little shallow. And, you know, these are the 24 inch tiles at the corner. And then we basically cast the equivalent of like a scribe plate longer than it needed to be. And then we just trimmed it on site so that we got a, a kind of smooth rounded corner here uh, on the house, on the outside of the house. Some of the windowsill details, 
uh, showing, you know, the clouding integrated into those openings, some of the diagonal, and we obsessed over this, you know, like, how are we going to do this? And, and when we watched the GC kind of just uh, like build it by just kind of hand forming like light metal framing and, and it works, you know, I, we wouldn't like spend so much time on it next time. Uh, we would do something similar, but all that seemed to work out great. And then, you know, introducing these skylights into the kitchen, just, just a few skylight details. This is interesting. I'm almost done. I'll flip through these. We, we took photos uh, like every week on the job site. And here you can see, this is where the old house ended and it was clad in bricks. So we took off the bricks. This is what the old landscape looked like. And, you know, a lot of people thought we were crazy to take all this stuff out. And they were nice, in some cases, mature tropical plants, but not a very usable space beyond a pathway. And really, we wanted to rethink this as like a, a space, not just, not just a pathway. So, you know, we built into the front yard and transformed this. And so I'll just show you like a photo, you know, at, at kind of key moments of construction. So they're excavating for the, for the grade beams. Um, there they are stacking up the foundations. Here they are before they pour the slab. Here they are, you know, stacking uh, the walls and the columns. There's our tie beam. There's the new roof trusses going up. At one point, the porta potty came into the courtyard. And then here it is, you can kind of finally see it like there as you open it up and then again we we, we just did sunset pavers from the same precaster as the wall tiles and here they here the wall tiles are coming into the courtyard and there it is and then one more view from the breezeway looking into the courtyard so you get an idea about what it was before Here's the slab, here go the walls, here they've opened it up. So you can see the old block and the new block here. That's the waterproofing. Where the windows went in. There it is. Okay, sorry. That, that, that's basically it. Uh, I'll end on this image. I have a book out recently. Um, if anyone is interested, email me. I'll send you a discount code. Uh, but a lot of the ideas in this book, I documented other architects kind of working through um, you know, methods of construction that they weren't quite certain about and often utilizing full-scale mock-ups. Kind of like we were doing at a smaller scale by you know compression testing those things um, but kind of expanding the the options available to them and and working through the issues through mock-ups uh, or physical physical constructions um, so yeah that's that <laughs> all right well thank you thank you nick um okay so now is um i guess the opportunity for questions um so it's open up for the students or, or colleagues uh, who wants to ask, ask any questions about the process or the construction or the finished house. <laughs> I do have a question if, while we wait. So when you were doing the research in the beginning with the FIU grant and you were doing the, the sort of the, the experimenting with the wood chips and the concrete and all that, was there any in like any, um, sort of idea like what the material could be used for like after like the tiles when did the tiles came up uh, as a as research um well we basically were kind of given um you know i wrote the grant and said look this this material seems full of potentials um and this guy this precaster in belgium he used it in a particular he was actually precasting wall sections and kind of using it to like, uh, you know, for precast buildings and he would go stack really long walls. Interestingly, he, he would use um, like 
diagonal timber reinforcing instead of steel because it's a kind of porous material. It breathes more, it draws in moisture and expands and, and releases it. So he was using it one particular way. He was interested in other opportunities because he wanted you know, to find more opportunity for it. So um, part of the independent study was we looked at you know, all kinds, we just started playing around with it. And then basically at a certain point, I said, how do we like get organized about this? Let's look at, and I divided the group into four groups and I said, you look at vertical applications for it. You look at horizontal applications for it, um, meaning, you know, flooring, you know, ground. So we looked at paving, mulch, we looked at making mulch. And in fact, we did mulch most of FIU's campus with this product. Um, and then, and we looked at modular applications and we looked for like detail applications. Um, so, uh, you know, and that was before this house was happening. And then when we had the opportunity to do the house, um, uh, you know, it was a kind of simple, like it's not, again, there's very, like a few moves in this house. It's mostly existing. We opened it up. We played with the location of the windows. And then we added this like curious texture to it. Um, but I would say it really came out when we when we started doing the house. And in fact, I used it. We gave a presentation to the president of the university uh, about the material and about possibly using it as mulch on campus. And so I really, while working on the layout of the house, quickly put together like a 3D of like if we applied it to my house. Uh, and then my wife, who was my client for this house, she really liked it. And uh, she said, you know, we should do that. So we did it. <laughs> okay. Okay, no, I mean, I guess also the question has to do with like the weight of the material, like how heavy it is and how, so like the, the, the pieces, one of the, uh, the, the, the elements that we're always discussing with students about facade systems is the, the tiling and the, the paneling because of logistics and transportation and, and, and how to handle it, how to install it. So I was just curious to see if that, sort of limitation was also part of the one of the design opportunities at the same time yeah yeah a, yeah a little and i honestly i don't think we could have i was concerned about actually you know adding this much weight to the outside of it uh, so you know we reinforced the tie beams and, and things like that um mm -hmm. but you know a little bit it was it was uh uh it was kind of an experiment that has worked so far. <laughs> okay. Uh, hello, Professor. I have a question. Uh, it's more of a general question. Uh, Jalpi, lovely project. Uh, it was nice seeing the drawings and everything. Um, I have a question regarding remodeling and retrofits. Um, when you were remodeling a house that was built before the implementation of other uh, building codes and regulations, do you have to update the entire house on the new building code or just the parts that are being remodeled or added? Um, Juan, Juan is probably better at answering this question than me generally. I'll tell you, like for this house uh, um, in Miami Beach, I think generally the answer is no, you don't have to bring everything up to code. As long as things are legally non-conforming, meaning they were built to code when they originally were built, um, they, they're basically grandfathered in, they're allowed to exist. Now, I should tell you like, because this is a corner lot, let me go back to the, um, let me go back to the site plan to explain a little bit about this. Uh, Part of what has changed in addition to building codes are, you know, the zoning codes change a lot over time. So basically, um, this is a corner lot, even though there's, you know, so it's a corner lot. My property line is basically like here. Um, and then this is street. And now, and now the setbacks in Miami Beach, for one thing, um, so the zoning but not the building code, is a minimum of seven and a half feet. We only have five feet. It used to be five feet in the beach until, you know, that was changed. But in addition to that, we don't have seven and a half feet. Now corner lots are required to be set back 15 feet, which would basically take us to like here. So part of, 
also part of the opportunity we saw in this house was that we could have this courtyard. If we were to build this from scratch now, I don't, I don't really think we could. Uh, this would all have to get shifted north and there wouldn't be any room left. Like we'd have to ship the entire thing 10 feet and it would become much more narrow um, of a courtyard and therefore probably couldn't be as deep. Uh, so that was something we liked about its existing non-conforming status. Um, and you know, some people are like, you should just demo this thing. Um, I'll also say this is a little off topic from your question, but you know, by remodeling this, concrete is expensive. I think at the time we built this, concrete was going, just the raw concrete was going about $100 a square foot. So just to add 400 square feet of new construction was like 40 grand just for that. So I often advise people, if you like a house that exists, you're saving all the money on the concrete that's already there. Because if you demo it and then rebuild it, you know, say a 3,000 square foot house at $400 a square feet, um, uh, you know, you're, you're talking $120,000 just in concrete. So, you know, we, we, we like to keep the kind of configuration of it and, and work with it. We had to get permission to do that though. So where that roof jog is, I actually like it, but the city required us to do that because you're only allowed to project 25% into the required setback, even though this one projected much more. They said, we'll allow you to extend this non-conforming condition. We had to apply for a variance at a public, uh, uh, at a land use board in Miami Beach, go through a public hearing process, present the plans and give neighbors the opportunity to oppose it or, or whatnot. But so we were able to extend it, but they wouldn't let us extend the roof overhang. I actually like it because you can see like where the new and old is, uh, but that was a city requirement actually. And then in addition to bringing things up to code, uh, there's a rule in Miami Beach, the municipality where if you have to appraise the structure, so you appraise the structure, not the property, the properties are worth way more than the buildings actually in the beach. Um, but so you appraise the existing structure and you can only spend half of what the appraisal is, 50% of the appraised value. And if you go over that, you need to bring everything up to code, um, even if it was legally conforming in the past. So that would be really nearly impossible for this house because for one thing, although it could be somewhat interesting, but our finished floor elevation, for instance, is less than seven feet. Now it would need to be at least nine. So we'd have to bring it up at least two feet. So like up to here to be legally conforming with you know zoning flood elevations, which wouldn't leave enough head height for the roof. So you know we, we didn't remove the roof, we waterproofed it, but we would have had to rip off the roof, add to the walls, then all the windows would be in the wrong locations, you know. So that would be a tough thing to do. Um, so we had to stay below the 50% rule uh, in order to do this. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Um, thank you for the lecture as well. It was really interesting to see, you know, your take on the project and everything. Um, so you just went over basically the, the finished floor nowadays would have to be a lot higher because of the flood levels and everything. But going back to when you were designing and building the house, is there anything that, um, that you had to take into consideration because of like sea level rise or anything like that? Any design uh, influences because of sea level rise? Um, I mean, not, I mean, you know, we were aware of that fact, like the, the finished floor elevation. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, one story buildings in a, in a, you know, high hazard area, like, like, Miami and so close to the water in Miami Beach, like realistically we realized we would not be able to stay uh, even if we raised the, the floor two feet, like we couldn't stay during a hurricane. It's basically a mandatory evacuation mm -hmm. zone anyway. So, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, of still houses and some of the things that like Renee Gonzalez is doing. And I'm now on the planning board of Miami Beach and we've made a lot of progress. The city up until now they, you can basically lift your house up on stilts, but they won't let you have more than seven and a half feet of head height um, usable. We changed that about a year ago as part of the planning board. We changed an ordinance to allow now, so before 
they wouldn't even let you have seven and a half feet. You could lift your house, you had to fill it in with earth. So it wasn't occupiable, that space. Like they're really worried about people exceeding their FAR and using that space. Um, but that should be usable and it makes a lot of sense if you look at older buildings for you know resiliency, uh, resilient urbanisms, you want the building up off the ground and the floodwaters go underneath and then that's okay. Uh, and you see that I'm from Louisiana, a lot of, you know, it's a high flood zone also. A lot of the older structures were built in that way. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of a stilt house. And now actually we have an ordinance amendment coming before the city where now um, you can, through a staff level review, a pretty simple procedure, you can now use, I believe, up to 10 feet below your house and you can actually occupy it. You can't enclose it, it needs to remain outside. But you could park under it, you could have an outdoor dining table under it, um, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think that is a really smart configuration for, you know, sea level rise. Um, but yeah, we realize, you know, this is a historic home. It's, it's, not, it's not optimized for that. But in terms of, you know, climate change, you know, we thought we were exploring a unique opportunity with this material. Um, that invasive species is kind of part of you know climate change and even in uh, Chicago I read a, a, a an article about 10 years ago how in Chicago the 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 native trees I forget exactly what the like state tree of Illinois is maybe they're ash trees or something but the temperatures have risen enough that beetles are now thriving there that are killing like what were once the native trees. So in Chicago, they're actually planting like cypress trees, uh, which are typically associated with like, uh, maybe not cypress, I forget exactly, but Southern trees that typically didn't exist in the North because they end up being much more resilient. So this idea about, you know, what has traditionally been a native species um, is an interesting one and a really slippery slope. And, I should point out, I read an, I read an article in, uh, in, in uh, a magazine called Clog, who did an issue about Miami about this. And South Florida has the most um, exotic and non-native flora and fauna in the world. Like they just have the most species. We have, you know, Burmese pythons, um, Indonesian lionfish, just everything. And really apex predators too, just kind of really reorganizing the entire ecology. Uh, so yeah, not, not, not sea level rise particularly, but um, you know other issues. Thank you, Nick. Could you talk a little bit about the detail on this on this slide that you have up at uh, the bottom of the wall, where it meets the the, the ground? Yeah, let me pull it up. Cause that's like uh, students um, always go to the. Uh, that problem when they're designing their buildings and making the drawings, like both one, inside right? and outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically, you know, this didn't exactly end up how we drew it. Um, but, you know, we did our best, like, you know, we were kind of looking at, you know, rain screen systems where, you know, it kind of prevents rain from hitting the wall and, and, but you still allow things to drain. So the waterproofing is behind. Um, even we weren't gonna grout the joints in these tiles, but the, on the last day when the guy finished installing these, he just grouted the whole thing. And the grout is kind of falling out. We didn't intend it to be like a watertight cladding. Um, so we always thought this would be the drainage zone. And it does, it does weep out of there through the back. There's about a one inch gap on the back of this thing. But I mean, the detail here basically is, and when we drew this, we didn't exactly know how this would be installed. I think we were thinking about side clips. But yeah, so this piece of flashing with the drip edge is so that this would come down and, and weep out that way and not, not go towards the, the slab. Probably this should like be a little higher up maybe. Um, but because we had that disparity between the finished floor elevation and the exterior, I also wanted, uh, to basically put gravel underneath this uh, and not to put the earth all the way up to the wall. So, you know, we drew this, this perimeter edge gravel here. And so again, it's supported with steel. They're kind of stacked up. Um, I don't think, 
I don't, this drip edge actually doesn't exist. Like at this point, we didn't put a drip edge into it. We just let it all kind of leak out the bottom. Um, but you see the block, you know, there's a, the, the block wall is here and waterproofing is, um, you know, I work with another architect often on projects and, you know, you know, stucco itself is a kind of waterproofing material. Like you can waterproof with stucco, but we like to, you know, first add an actual, I think if you don't specify a waterproofing product, um, you know, you're asking for problems. So, you know, we typically will do like some membrane or in this case, it's pretty typical. Actually, we asked the builder who you, he gave us some submittal some liquid applied waterproofing on top of the blocks um, and then mounted this to that. Now we'll do the liquid applied and then layers of felt and then stucco is, is pretty typical. Um, that's kind of what we did in the courtyard section, but this is the one facing, facing the outside. Right. I don't know. I, you, you have any other questions about it? No, no, no. I mean, the, to, I guess why, I mean, why is the tile not touching the ground? That's, I mean, why the gap? I mean, yeah. I know, I know why, but it's, it's good you can explain it. Yeah, um, I guess, um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, my, again, my father-in-law, he likes to question uh, my moves. So he says, uh, why, look, you messed it up. Why doesn't it touch the ground? And again, it's a little bit of that issue of, in, in New Orleans, um, you know, they, they kind of have the climate issues that we have minus minus the water problems we have, but they have it worse. And maybe they don't have the wind that we have, but in New Orleans, everything rots and they really build everything still out of wood. It's very common. Like you can still build a home stick frame to this day. Uh, in South Florida, you can't really do it because of the insurance regulations, but the wind requirements, but there they still do. And so, you know, I went to architecture school in New Orleans and just, you know, from, very early on, my professor said, you know, don't touch, don't touch the ground. You want to kind of like hover up above it. So this was just a simple nod. Part of it was for, you know, constructability alignment issues, just so that we don't have to coordinate this with this. And there would be moments where this is higher and that's lower. So just, it's kind of like a reveal, a construction reveal, but also, yeah, this allows drainage at the edge. So water isn't like, this isn't sitting in puddles, for instance. Uh, and I would say, you know, that those are like the two primary reasons. Right. Good, good, good. Okay. If there is no more questions, we can probably go back to studio. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great job, um, Nick. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, guys. Project, Thank, Nick. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Nick. If Thank you, you take my that. master project studio, I invite my studio for a barbecue at the end of the year. <laughs> awesome. I'll be there. All right. <laughs> That'll be my master project presentation this year. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Take care, guys. Talk to you soon. Right. Thank you, Nick. Okay. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you. Okay.